Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Taha Ma anzalna alayka Dan 
wa ana akhtartuka fasma lima yuha sadaqallahu al-aliyyul azim al-fatiha tasbuk as-salatu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Um, before we start, do you guys mind uh, filling up the rows in the front? That way, Hajj doesn't have to scream and it's more intimate of a discussion. That, so please, uh, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Thank you guys. Uh, this is much nicer. Uh, thank you all for coming to our Friday night program. We just have one announcement. Our winter retreat registration is now open. It will be Friday, December 27th through the 29th, Sunday the 29th. $200 per attendee at Lake Huron Retreat Center. If you guys want more information, you can ask me or uh, anybody, any MYC member. We all have amazing experiences with the winter retreat. If you want information about that, questions about how to register, please approach me. The registration is at www.muslimretreats.org. Uh, it's truly a life-changing experience, so please don't miss out on it. Um, so we'd like to welcome uh, our beloved Hajj Wissam Bezi now for the topic of the solution of anxiety and depression after uh, a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There's always things that are so tricky all the time. Salla ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. Abil Qasim Muhammad wa ala ali baytihi al-tayibin al-tahirin. Alhamdulillah, it's the birth of the Prophet, so congratulations. It's a celebration that needs to be had internally before externally. Um, in the Quran, it says about the Prophet, it says, Qawsayni aw adna, meaning in the Quran, when he went up into, to, literally in Mi'raj, when he went up to the ascension towards Allah, the Prophet got so close that he was two bows lengths or closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Jibra'il at one point had to stop. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I cannot go any further. But you can. Why? There is nothing in that gap. Those two bows lengths or closer, there is nothing in that gap. There's no other creature that ever has that has ever been created that's in that gap rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi is the closest creature to allah the closest entity ever created and he is your prophet allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad once you understand that it should give you chills in your heart you, the beat Literally, you should feel it. It's a different beat. It's a different rhythm to your heart. Why? This is the man I'm behind. That's incredible. I want to give you a story, just to begin. Prophet Musa asked Allah. He says, Ya Allah, show me my neighbor in heaven. Allah says to him, he says, go to this house 
and enter it. Musa follows and he goes. He goes to the house, he knocks on the door, this young man opens up. He introduces himself, doesn't tell him he's the prophet. He says, may I come into your quarters? The young man invites him in. He's conversing with him. And he's telling him, what do you do? He's asking him questions. He wants to know his neighbor. Why is he his neighbor? Is this you? Is it you? Is it me? Don't know. This is specified for certain people. It's incredible. But how? How do you get to such an extent? You will be the neighbor of a prophet in heaven. How? Is it by taking anxiety pills? I can't handle my depression. Is it putting your mind on automatic pilot? What is it? Where do you go? Right now it's an epidemic. Literally it's an epidemic. One out of three women, one out of three women is on antidepressant pills. Guys, watch out. I'm joking, joking. That was a bad joke. Joking. Guys are not too far behind. Don't worry. You got to step into your masculine just a little bit. We need our men to what? A little more backbone. Stand up. Be who you are. Don't be afraid to identify who you are. Don't be afraid. This is your manhood. It's your right. You need to do that. I'm sorry. If your eyebrows are better than hers, I'm sorry. I have problems with that. But it's okay. It's cool. It's not a big deal. Just know who you are. Know your masculine role and who you are. My sisters also put the career just a little bit, just one step behind the family. It's cool too. The independency thing is awesome. I love it. But it's, it's got to be regulated. There's obligations. We have to raise families. Alhamdulillah. You don't want them ending up seeing me. Trust me. That's not where you want them to end up. So now, He's going back and forth. The kid inside the house, he's a young man. He keeps leaving the Prophet, alayhi salam, and he keeps entering this room, and coming back out. He keeps entering, coming back out. And he's talking to him. He interrupts him. He says, why? Why do you keep doing that? He says, I'm sorry. Forgive my manners. But my mother's inside. And she's a sick woman. I have to tend to her. And now, he says, can I see her? He says, sure. Prophet Musa goes inside. He looks at the woman and she's murmuring something you couldn't hear. He's trying to understand. And he says, he asks the young man, he's like, what is she saying? He says, for a long time now, all she prays for is to be in heaven next to the prophets. Think about that. She can't move. She's got no capability. But she's got a tongue that recites the beautiful thing. This is the antidote to depression. I will take you there. I will show you how. It's right here. Literally, it's right here. When this connects properly up here and your thoughts connect properly down here, there's nothing in this world that can touch you. Nothing. This is the antidepressant. And I'm going to show you how. Now, first part. Where does it come from? Why do we become depressed? Why? Why do we get to states where we want to take our life 
which is the highest form of self-hate. To be able to take your life is to say to yourself, I hate myself enough that the value of my life should be taken and it has no worth. That's the highest form of self-hate. How do you move to self-love? Where Imam Ali alayhi salam says, he says, I've stood at the gate of my heart and let nothing in but the love of Allah. How do you get to that level? What should you do to attain such might that your intention is like a mountain? It cannot be moved. When a situation comes, temptation, anger, whatever it is, you stand and you hold back and you fight yourself in so many different ways and you don't speak. You hold back. You pull on that mental muscle and you say, no, I'm not going there. You step back and you don't go through that door. Then Allah all of a sudden opens the door for you on His own. Something you would have never seen before. That's how you have to fight. But watch. The first thing we do to get to this extent and this way of literally getting yourself to where you're not satisfied. You're never satisfied. Everyone these days is looking for what? Fulfillment. I have everything. I can go to the gas station. Hey, it takes us an hour just to pick a drink. I don't know what I want. There's so many choices. You're trying to get a candy bar. It takes you three hours in the gas station. It's like you're going shopping. It's so hard. It's literally hard. It's hard. I swear to you, it's hard. Because there's so many choices. You have everything you want. Where? Right here. Go on any website you want. Anywhere around the world. You press a few buttons. Next day, mashallah, Mr. Amazon. Hey, I got you. Whatever you need. Just press a few buttons. And some of you have a little card, credit card problems. It's okay. You got to hold back on those things too. Now, what are we trying to do? We're trying to become emotionally satisfied, fulfilled. In the Quran, it states, What does that mean? Surely, the one who's best amongst you is the one who's God conscious. What does that mean? How do you stay God conscious? What is that? Is that satisfaction? How do you get to that point? Now, what's the difference between tasbih and dhikr? Can anybody tell me very quickly? What's the difference between tasbih and dhikr? What's the difference? Naam? Excellent. What's the difference between the two? يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Everything does tasbih to Allah. It glorifies Allah. Everything. Who is that incumbent on when the sun is letting off its radiation? When the earth is spinning around the sun, the moon is spinning around what? The earth. Are they submitting to Allah? Yes. They are. They're doing what they have been commanded. They're doing tasbih of Allah. Human beings have to do what? Dhikr. What is dhikr? salata li dhikri. Surely, establish prayer for what? So you can remember me. If you have to remember, thank you. If you have to remember something, it means that you can what? What? What does it mean? If you have to remember something, it means you can forget. What do we forget? That's the key. 
everything is always in submission to Allah because everything is determined because it doesn't have free will. You've been given free will. You have a choice. You can remember or you can what? Forget. Dissatisfaction comes from what? Forgetting. Forgetting what? Watch this. Now, as we move along, in everything that you do, the first part is this. As we are moving in this life, we start trying to identify who we are. An identity is based on principles of who you are. Principles. What are principles? Thoughts immersed in emotion. That's a principle. When that thought of protection, protecting someone you really care for, has a lot of emotion behind it, that becomes you. That becomes the sweetness to sugar, the wetness to water, the oiliness to what? Oil. It's part of your essence. It cannot be removed. Either way, good or bad. Bottom line. Now, the first place we look for identity is where? Outside or inside? Outside. Facebook, Instagram, what else? I have to go a little. It's okay. It's okay. We'll play with it a little bit. But I have to do these things. I start looking for that light, bu- light button to do what? Validate who I am. If you don't like me, and I don't like me, you see that? If you say I'm not good, I say I'm not good. Your opinion of me is greater than my own opinion of myself. If you have that in your heart, trust me right now, please, please, take note of your own thoughts and emotions. I deal with a lot of people in this community. The antidepressant problem is an epidemic. The drug problem is an epidemic. It's all over. As soon as one of my clients sits down right in front of me, I know. I know. I know where they're at. It's scary when you look at someone like that. Why? Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says about the shaitan and how he describes shaitan and his people. Listen. He describes us. Not the shayateen. Not the jinn. He describes us. He's like, it's as if shaitan has laid eggs and hatched in their heart. He creeps into their lap. He speaks through their tongue. That's a human being. You can go there. Not one of us is safe. That can be you. That can be me. That's how powerful that is. But you have another power. Watch this. When we start... Number one rule you got to understand. First thing you need to take with you. Everybody right now, sign this somewhere on your heart. Okay? Take your pen. Not a physical pen. MashaAllah, none of us take notes because we're all our memories are just amazing. By tomorrow, you'll remember, you'll remember 11%. Lily, that's what studies indicate. Everybody's too good for notes. It's okay. No problem. Your imam says, if you want to remember something, write it down. It's advice. Thank you, sister. I appreciate it. See, just to get underneath your skin. Thank you. You have. Well, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I appreciate you taking notes. That's awesome. 
Now, the first thing is comparison. I'm going to take you through a superiority perspective and an inferiority perspective and how it works. We're going to go into a little bit of psychology, but we're going to connect it to the Quran. And you're going to see how that works. What happens when you're superior in thought? And what happens when you're inferior in thought? And how that works? The first level, let's talk about superiority. What happens when you look down on people? And you become condescending in the way you think? How does that happen? I have to take one good thing about myself. And I have to have a blanket perspective that I'm all good. I have no faults. When that happens, you start looking at everybody. And I, I sit down with people too. Some of my clients are like that too. And you know what happens with them? My God, when they sit in front of me. I'm coming after you mentally. And to me, I'm not good at a lot of things. But you enter my arena in terms of what I'm really good at, I'm going to break your arm. I'm going to break you mentally. And you better be ready. Now, what happens? That person becomes haughty. They become so full of themselves. I know and I know better than other people. Why? They're the person that if they get what? They get 99.9 into you're struggling to get like an 80%. Or like 99.9%. .9%. That's the person you hate. Like, it's like, come on, man. Then they get mad. They're, they're actually worse than you. They get so mad. There's a difference there. Some people, because they do want to be best, not because they're arrogant. They just have high standards. That's good. But what if you just want to be best no matter what? If you have the capability or you don't. Here's the comparison. Who does shaitan compare himself to? Who? Allah gives us a command. He says, Ishjudu li Adam. That's you. That's me. Our kind. Allah has given us that kind of privilege. This is your stature and what you can reach as a human being. You have the Prophet in front of you as a guide. You have the imma and you have what? This. This is your manual. How do you dare say, you know what? I don't have anything. How? How do you get to such audacity that you say, I don't know where I'm going? How? How do we get to that level and we think that we don't have nothing? We don't. Wow, really? Allah repeats this again and again and again. Which of my bounties are you going to call me a liar for? Allah is saying this. You know what I've given you? But you still don't have enough. He says, Allah, he says, bow down to Adam. You, me. We are the best creation. We've created man in the best stature. Then we've reduced him to the lowest of the law. We can go that far. We can go to become beneath the animals. Literally. Now, he says to Allah, Iblis objects. He says, Ana khayrun minhu. He says, I am better than him as a creation. See the comparison? Right there. That can lead you to damnation when you do that. When you compare in the wrong way. He says, Ana khayrun minhu. خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِنْ طِينٍ You've created me from fire and you created him from what? Mud. Look at the comparison. That's superiority. Why? Think about this. Adam and his creation, alayhi salam, caused an insecurity inside who? The shaitan. That's what happens to us. That's what happens inside your heart. That's a spiritual disease right there. The second you compare, 
and you look at that person and you say, wow, he's got something, but he's created a, what? Insignificance inside of me. I feel less of worth. What did the shaitan have to do? What did he have to do? All he had to do was what? What did he have to do? What? That's it. Some of us, I'm sorry. We choose to be in that corner because we don't want to what? See, I'm making myself as small as possible because I don't want anybody to chuck anything at me. Okay? We don't want to abide. We don't. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You hear the adhan, you have it on your phone, but your heart doesn't want to move. It doesn't want to follow. You haven't programmed yourself properly. This thing, I'm sorry, sitting on the shelf. And you wonder why you're not satisfied. Allah bi Wow. The antidote is where? I'm sorry. I'm going to keep raising this thing up. I like it. Okay? But it's there. It's inside here. If this, the information, stays in the book, I'm sorry. You lost. If you download it into here, and it becomes yours. This is what happens. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi sallallahu ala muhammad wa alayhi muhammad. The Prophet he narrates a hadith and he says there will be a young man that when you die is wandering and wandering around what? Your funeral. A beautiful young man and this young man will slip himself into your between you and your shroud he will go into the grave with you when the two angels come to you and they're about to question you they will see the young man and they will tell him to leave he says I can't leave he says you need to leave it's not who you are that's being questioned. He says, I can't leave him. They ask him why. He says, I am the Quran he used to recite out loud. I swear to you, that makes my heart just, it's, it's pain. It's not even, it's pain. You know why? Because I don't do it enough. I don't. He says, wherever he goes, I need to protect him. And I will not leave till I take him to heaven with me. Grab this thing, please. هذا القرآن يهدي لي التي هي أقوام this book will guide to what is best. Is anybody depressed right now? Are you depressed? Did I emotionally groom you a little bit? Psychologically groom you a little bit? Why? If your heart at this moment is beating to a different Drum. The Quran has touched you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has touched you. Now, first level is comparison on a superior level. When we compare on a superior level, that's what happens. Let's compare where? On an inferior level. Some of us have this spiritual disease. We look at others. And they're better than us. This problem is I'm better than everyone. And no one can take the number one position. No one. That's what happens. If something is created that's better than me, 
I have to make sure it's done. And Iblis takes that vow with Allah. That I'm going to make sure what? He submits. And I'm going to take a lot of them with me. He, he's, he asks Allah for that. Allah grants it. So now, how do you compare on a superior than inferior level? Inferiority is when I look at someone and they have more likes than I do. Or they have more followers than I do. I start hating them. You're not. They're always getting a better grade than me. They become your point of reference for perfection. They become your standard. That's sad. No one should be your standard but you. You've been created for your own maximum potential, not for anybody else's. He's fashioned you in the womb of your mother as he pleases. Your height, your weight, your eye color, everything is special for you to take on your own journey. That's my daughter signaling me, so I had to give her the okay. Alhamdulillah. We have that kind of communication. Now, here's what happens. Look at the story of Qabil and Habil. And you'll get the inferiority perspective. Here's what happens. Qabil makes a dua to Allah. It's not accepted. Habil makes a what? Also dua to Allah. And it's accepted. Qabil compares himself to who? His brother. His brother. Your own brother. You can have the wrong emotional code towards your own brother. Your own father. Your own mother. It doesn't matter. Once you emotionally condition yourself the wrong way, it's incredible what happens and how you become as a human being. What does Qabil end up doing? Anybody know? He killed his brother. Why? One word. What's the first thing? Comparison. Comparison causes jealousy. Causes envy. These are the things that become spiritual diseases. And then you have an emotional cancer in your heart that needs to be eradicated. But you need surgery. Trust me. And it's not the Facebook button or the Instagram button. It's not how many likes you get. It's not that. It's not how many times tell you people tell you you're pretty. And for my sisters, you put on the war makeup, and it's like you're going to war. For my brothers, the shirts just get tighter and tighter and tighter. It's like... <clears throat> I do understand. I was there. Okay? No problem. Why? We need that attention from the outside. If you like me, I like me. You click like, I like. Right? That's how I get my validation of who I am. That's how I gain my self-esteem. By other people's opinion of me. When that happens, that's what it causes. You become envious, jealousy, all kind of things happen at that level. The other side of superiority, arrogance, conceit, all types of problems there too. What are we supposed to do? Imam Ali alayhi salam gets the perfect answer. This is number two. We said number one is comparison. Just knowing what comparison is. Number two, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, Al Qanaha Malun La. Can somebody say it? Hasan. I love when people just finish things. Just it's exciting. Like, okay, you're with me. He says, 
Contentment is a wealth that never exhausts. Never. It's never exhaustive. You cannot remove it. Contentment. Why? Can anybody please, please just follow along and just get this point. Why is contentment a wealth that doesn't become exhaust? It can never be ex- exhausted. Why? Can anybody tell me? Because it removes the first rule that we talked about. What is that first rule? Excellent. If you're content, if you're truly content in your heart, you're satisfied. If you're satisfied, do you care about what he has? Do you care about what she has? No. Allah give them more. You become a giver. Your heart is filled. Why? Because you're satisfied. Whatever you have, Ya Allah, I'm content. Imam Ali goes further. He says, the richest person is the one who's content with what he has. Why? He's emotionally rich. There's a difference between having wealth and being wealthy in richness. But everybody's after what? What's everybody after? Emotional richness. That's more expensive. You want to know why? This is why. Because people think they can take a pill, pop it into my mouth, and I'm going to be okay. And I'm not making fun of it. Trust me. Some people, okay, if you're on extremes, Sometimes those things can help. Okay? I'm not against the science. But it's an epidemic. Everybody who has a problem, bam. Give them what? Just give them medication. Put them and pacify their mind. I'm sorry. I've gotten people off of heroin before. Heroin, drugs, anything you want. They become directors of major companies. I'm sorry. I don't agree fully. How does that happen? Where should you stand? You have to know how to fight the battle. How do you become content? How do you get to such a point in your heart that you can pull on that mental muscle at will and you bring contentment to your own heart at will? Number one, remove comparison. If you see someone that's got more than you, pray for them. Say, Allah, give them more. Don't feel envious. Say, Allah, give them more. And give me what they have. Completely different. You can do that. That's not hasad. There's a different form. I'm not going to get into that. You can wish for what they have as well. But ask this way. Say, Allah, this is good for me. Give it to me. If it's good for me. Because I don't know. I don't know where things can end up. If it's good for me, Allah, give it to me. No matter how much I want it. Abu Dhar was asked, he says, what do you want? He says, I want what Allah wants for me. Can we submit our wants to what Allah wants? Can you do that? That's difficult. That's not easy. Habibi, oh my God, I love her. Can't, can't sleep because she's on my mind 24 7. She left me. I can't. Can you submit your want? Can you tell yourself no? Man khafa rabbi, my God. Surely, whoever fears the state of his Lord. Fears, meaning they're God conscious. When they're about to make a decision, they look at Allah and they say, Ya Allah, what do you want? And they pull back. And they push against their negative desires, the regressive ones, that I make a bad decision that you have to clean up later. Short term gain, but long term pain. Now, Surely heaven is his abode. Contentment is set up this way. Please pay attention. This doesn't exist in psychology. I'm sorry. It's our religion. Okay, that's a secret. Okay, I'm going to just go like this. It's our religion.
kitchen, okay? Okay? Yes? Okay. Now, you can tell other people when you leave, okay? Now, how do you gain contentment? How? Let's go to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam says there's four levels. Four levels. I'm going to go through three because the fourth is just, I think, his domain. The guy, me and him are boys. Alhamdulillah. I hope he looks at me that way. I don't know. He might look at me on the day of judgment. <laughs> He might laugh. That's my hope. I'm hoping to be like that young man. But Musa, I'm sorry. I want to see my boy first. That's my icon. My daughter, when she was younger, I'll share this quick story for you. I'm sitting down, and Najil Balagha is right next to me. And she comes and she asks me, she says, Baba, who's your best friend? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I look down, I see Najib Allah. I go, she goes, tell me. I'm like, Imam Ali, alayhi salam. She goes to me, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, Imam Ali. She goes to me, okay, so how do you communicate with him? I'm, I'm stuck. I'm like, okay, what do I say? She's literally like six. And she's got me in a corner and I'm being beat up by a five year old, six year old. I said, the way I communicate with him is I talk to him. I ask him, Ya Mira Munin, what would you do? And I study his patterns of thinking. That's the way he talks to me. I read his book. That book has changed my life. Literally, I swear to you, Nahj al-Balagha, for me, has changed my life. And it was done by a series for Sheikh Radwan Arasto. It's on YouTube. It's an incredible series about Imam Ali alayhi salam. I'm going through it for like the fifth time. You never get enough. No. Then she says to me, she goes, okay, how does he talk to you? I said, that. She goes, then, all right. Then how do you talk to him? And she says to me, I'm like, I'm stuck again. Then it just hit me. And I'm like, I just follow what he says. I'm like, got you back. Why is this important? Because at the end of the day, this is the way it works. When he talks, just please pay attention. That's the code for your heart. Imam Ali alayhi salam and Nahj al-Balagha state so much. Follow that book. Download that into your system as much of it as you can. Now, but let's go there. First level, Imam Ali alayhi salam talks about if you want to get to a point where you have satisfaction in the heart, this is the way you do it. The magic pill for depression is this. Can anybody tell me before I say it? thousand dollar question bet you if I give you a thousand dollars it'd be different can anybody say everybody would have a lot more courage just to say their answer just imagine you're going to get a thousand dollars with Allah okay you're going to get a thousand hasanat I'll sell you land in heaven right now okay I'm selling land in heaven as like if I own it or something okay but tell me you want some I got you what is it? Okay, excellent answer. What else? What is it? Quran. 
Excellent. What else? Naam? Taqwa. Beautiful answer. Wow, it's coming from the heart. I love that. What else? Praying. Excellent. He talks about prayer. In the Quran, it states this. Please pay attention. This is the magic verse. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You ready? Ready? And if somebody, if somebody, if someone wants to really understand their own emotional state, trust me, it sits in this. It says, وَمَنْ تَبَعَ هُدَعِ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَى Whoever follows my guidance, Allah is talking to us directly. He will never go astray or never be unhappy. Let's finish the verse. Does anybody know what follows? Does anybody know? Can anybody finish the ayah? Please look for this tonight and study it. Study it. Then he says, Woman Aradan Dikri. That's the word. That's the pill. Woman Aradan Dikri. Whoever refrains from remembering me. Akana Lahu Maishatan Dunkan. Surely. That person will live a depressed life. I just put the world on your shoulders. Because now you know. Surat, anybody can bring it up? I like to put the contest thing into place. Can anybody? Can anybody bring it up? You got Google in your hands. Come on. Anybody? You got 10 seconds. Five. Okay. You can't? Are you serious? Okay. How about this? I think I can do better with... I'm just joking. Okay. So, all right. So I'm going to raise my voice a little bit. It's it's a, it's a sensitive topic, so you just gotta just make it no, like warm and cozy, so just the hearts can can bundle up properly. So now, here's what happens. I'm gonna leave you to that. I'm gonna leave you to that. Find it on your own. I like to do that. Why? It's gonna force you to travel a journey. It's gonna force you to do it. It's not that I have the verse. No. It's for you to find out and research. Now, it says, whoever, whoever as a person goes against and he doesn't remember me, what happens? Taha, which, which ayah? Asant. No, don't say it, please. Don't say it. Please, no, no. No, it's okay. It's okay. See, now I'm selling you. This is sales 101, by the way. I create curiosity, then I become the prize. Where now everybody wants it. I just pull back a little bit. And I train sales, by the way. Okay? But I just give you one, then I just pull back, and it's amazing what happens. Just the love scarcity. When Apple tells you, listen, we ran out of phones, guess what? They didn't run out of phones. You know what they're doing? They're ripping your control away from you. That's what triggers that. They trigger the fear of loss. That's how marketing works. They'll give you something, then they'll pull it away. And watch how you chase. It's amazing. Sisters, if you ever meet a guy like that, run the other way. Trust me. Trust me, just run. He's too good. Guys, please don't do that. Don't. If you have any conscience, trust me, she's got more to lose than you do. Okay? Sisters, when you post, 
I'm going to go directly now. I'm shver amai. Okay? When you post, please be very careful. Those eyes that are looking at you are not looking at you the way you think. I'm sorry. Okay? Guys, when you're looking at those pictures, lower your gaze. I know it's hard. But guys, we all have a responsibility towards each other to build the right community. Please, stay strong in your faith. Hold on to who you are. Now, let's go to the three and I'll finish with this. The antidote is dhikr. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, he says, in dua kumil, ya ma ismuhu dawa, ya ma dhikruhu shifa, wa ta'atahu ghina. O the one whose name is medicine, and whose remembrance is healing. For what? For what? That's the healing of the heart. That's the emotional satisfaction. That's what Imam Ali alayhi salam is talking about. That he has nothing, that nothing has entered his heart besides what? The love of Allah. That's what you have to work on. How? This is how. He also gives us what? The way to do it. Number one, he tells us this. Number one is a rida, which is contentment. Contentment is being satisfied. Contentment is removing comparison. That's number one. We talked about that. Number two, pay attention, take notes. This is your antidepressant pill. I'm sorry, it's not physical. It's thought process. He says, Taslim. What is Taslim? Anybody can tell me what Taslim is? That's how you get the rida, by the way. The insan, when he does Taslim, you know what the first thing he does? Let's go. You let go. What do you let go of? All of us are trying to hang on to control. The mother of Musa, when it was time to protect Musa, and Pharaoh, who was a tyrant, was coming after all the babies, she puts him in the river. I want you to be that mother for a second, or even that father. She's handing on, hanging on to the edge of the basket. Think about that. Think about the connection between a mother and a child. There's no other greater connection and attachment. Imagine the second. She lets go. And she pushes the baby. Can you do that? To protect it. If anyone was looking at her from the outside, they would say, she's crazy. How would you protect the child by putting him out in the open? Well, logic dictates you should hide him. That's what Taslim. I'm satisfied. This is where you let go. Most of us, what we want, the thing that most creates insecurity is always trying to what? Control outcomes. You're always trying to control outcomes. That's what creates insecurity. I'm not telling you not to think of outcomes. Musa also, alayhi salam, thought about outcomes. And he says to Allah, he says, Ya Allah, when Allah commands him to go to Fir'aun, he says, Ya Allah, I fear he may rush in punishment. I fear he may rush in punishment. Is that an outcome? Absolutely it's an outcome. What does Allah reply? He says, go. I am hearing, knowing. Let go of the outcome. You drop the outcome, you will drop the fear. Guaranteed. Why? Because now you do tawakkul. Which 
is the last stage. Rida, satisfaction in the heart. How do you do that? Let go of control. How do you let go of control in the present moment? Drop the outcome in the future. And rely on Allah. وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا And rely on Allah and He's all you need. That's how it works. When you can do that and you can stand and you can be in front of anyone, it doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter who's in front of you, trust me, I've been in front of major CEOs, millionaires and billionaires. One billionaire after a two-hour conversation, six, seven people, doesn't even know me. Last conversation, what happens, was between me and him, and he's crying to me. I'm nothing special, trust me. But at the end of the day, it's just how you talk. It doesn't matter who's in front of you. Your intention will become like a mountain. Nothing can move it when your identity is intact. That's what happens. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. That was my proof. No, that was a good one. Perfect timing. No, so on that level, number one is we compare. I'm going to recap real quick. We compare. And when we compare, here's what happens. You either become superior or inferior. How do you remove that? Become content. How do you gain being content? Number one, how to, how to be satisfied. You have to become satisfied. To be satisfied, you have to drop comparison. First law. To become more satisfied, let go of what? Control. How do you let go of control? You do the teslim part. How do you let go of that? And you become a person who's even more refined, you do teslim, then you do tawakkul. And you drop the outcome. Teslim is in the moment. You let go in the moment. Tawakkul is in the outcome. You submit fully to who? Allah Azza wa Jal. That is power. Like you wouldn't believe. Inna Allah ja'ala dhikr jila'an lil qulub. Allah has made dhikr and enlightenment for the heart. When Allah is in your heart, in the Quran it states, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِهِ Know that Allah is in between you and your heart. When that happens, I just want to know, when Allah is facing depression, who's going to win? Who's going to win? The next time you submit, this is the place to do it. وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي Establish prayer for what? My remembrance. Not me, of course. Establish prayer so you remember Allah. Because we have the capacity to do what? To forget. We are the only creatures who can forget about Allah. So your prayer is the navigation system. When Allah tells you to pray, why? It's not for Him. It's for you to get reoriented. It's to go back on the path. اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ We say this every day. Show us the true path. When Allah is always telling you, come here. I'm right here. I'm not that far away from you. In the أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are surely closer to you than your own juggler vein. He's that close to you. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٍ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعْ He says, Allah is telling us, he says, if, he's telling the Prophet, he says, if my supplicator asks you about me, tell him or her, I am near. I will answer the call of the supplicator. If, look at the if, it becomes conditional. Why? Conditional statements can only exist when there's options. You have options. You have options. You can choose to submit or not submit. 
إن أهديناه السبيلة إما أهديناه السبيلة إما شاكرا وإما قفورة We surely we have shown you the way It's already there Your fitra is enough He's either thankful or he lets it go. Which side do you want to be on? It's up to you. That's how you recap yourself. When you do that, when rida enters the heart, meaning contentment, it removes comparison. When you remove comparison and you do taslim and you drop your will to Allah and you what? Do the tawakkul drop the outcome, so you drop the fear, here's what happens. When Musa goes to Pharaoh, what happens in the outcome? وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ My God. He says, they plan, and Allah plans. And Allah is the best of planner. Wow. Drop your outcomes. Watch what happens. You want to know the most powerful place, and I'll finish with this, is this. Who can tell me really quickly what's the most powerful position on the face of this earth? What is it? Prostration. This is dignity. Your face is dignity. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, when a beggar would come to his door, and they were Muslim or any human being, he would reach around the door and he wouldn't look at their face. Look at the akhlaq of Amim al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. Why? Because that face holds dignity. He doesn't want to shame the person. That's akhlaq. This is dignity. When Allah tells you to put your maximum point of dignity on the lowest point that it can be, That's where the finite, the limited, meets the unlimited. That should give you chills. That's your power as a human being. Right there is your antidepressant. Whenever you are feeling that pain, you've committed the worst thing in the world. You've done the worst thing in the world. You don't and you can't stand yourself. Please, put yourself in that state of submission. Please. And watch. Just talk to Allah. Empty out your heart there. No psychologist. No pill. Nothing is better than that position. Trust me. And ask Allah to show you. Allah, show me the way. Please. When you do that, and if your intention is proper, Allah guarantees the response. He guarantees it. Kataba ala nafsihi rahma. He's encompassed himself with what? And he's made himself, he's made it incumbent on himself in terms of his mercy. That's how we need to be as human beings. The second you submit, taslim, and your heart submits. Not your just your physical body. Your heart goes into sujood. There's nothing on this face of this earth that can touch you. Sallallahu Muhammad to Ali Muhammad. Any quick Q and A? We'll do a quick Q and A. Anybody want to ask any questions? Yes, excellent, excellent question. So, how do you drop the outcome? Number one thing, when I say outcome, I say I mean consequences. In the Quran, it says this: It says, "What tamanna wal maut in kuntum sadiqin." Always refer back to the Quran. It's it's amazing once you have that with you, but it's not in just in the book like I told you. It's with you. You carry the verses with you. You can talk, walk. Speak the Qur'an. It's important. It becomes part of your language. So now, when it says that, here's what it means. It says, long for death if you are truthful. 
Study the, the equation there. What happens? If you long for death, death is encompassed with what? When we think about death, right now, Malik al is going to come to you. He's like, bro, Khayya, you got five minutes. And the khamis the ayah. Okay? You got five minutes. Wallahi, those five minutes, it's like, you feel like what? The most precious time you will ever have. وَأَنفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ حَدَكُمْ الْمَوْتِ فَيَقُولَ رَبِّ لَوْ لَا أَخَّرْتَنِي لَوْ لَا أَخَّرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ فَأَسْصَدَّقَ وَأَكُنْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Now Allah answers فَلَا يُؤَخِّرُ اللَّهَ نَفْسًا إِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهَا He gives you the psychology of us when we cross over and we haven't done what we need to do. He gives us that. He says we start asking for more time. We don't ask to go to heaven. We don't ask to ask for anything. We don't ask for a big house, a car, whatever. What do we start asking for? More time. That's the outcome. So now, from here, when that happens, when that happens, when you drop the outcome, death is encompassed with fear. Not many of us can face death because it has so much fear in it. When you drop the outcome, you drop the fear. That's what happens. The second you drop the outcome, you drop the fear. Now, when you drop the outcome, what happens? The fear gets replaced with what? Security. I say, I drop the outcome to who? To Allah. I do that. And I say, the outcomes, Ya Allah, are on you. I don't have any control over that. When that happens, now security enters the heart. It's no longer fear. Whatever I'm fearing, the outcome, that's what happens. Take it to psychology. Psychology in psychological studies, you're 50% more likely to fail if you think of outcomes. You're 98% likely to succeed if you worry about process, which is in the initial moment. It's incredible. So now, when you do that and you flip the fear to security, you know what happens inside your heart as well? You become sincere. Because you no longer fear what? Outcomes or consequences. That makes what? Your tongue what? Truthful. Because you don't care who's in front of you. Because you've dropped it and you put it on Allah's lap. Ya Allah, you take care of the outcome. I'm just going to become sincere with you. What I'm going to say in kuntum sadiqeen. Long for death if you are truthful. That means with truth, there's no fear when you are submit to Allah. Drop the outcome, you gain sincerity and security in the heart. When that happens, the tongue becomes truthful. When you speak, wow. This is what Imam Ali says. He says, when you speak, man intalaqa min al-qalb, waqa'a fil qalb. Wa man intalaqa min al-lisan, he says, whatever comes out of the heart with that sincerity and that truth, truthful tongue, what happens? When you speak, your words are encompassed with two things, your truth and logic and your sincerity. Imam Ali says, when you speak and it comes out of the heart, it will enter the heart. And when you speak from the tongue, it will stop at the other person's ears. Why? There's no sincerity. So when you speak, your words will engage the other person's mind. Your sincerity will engage their heart. Different languages. Completely different conversation. Drop the outcome. That's what will happen. That safety, no pill can give you. You can never gain that satisfaction. And I promise you, you do that properly, I promise you, the power you feel with that is incredible. It's incredible. I'll give you a small little story. We had to get an NFL player who was Muslim. Eight months. It was a project. I said the project. I said what? We're going to get this player. They're less than 1% in the NFL. Less than 1%. Seven months go by. We don't have a player. Everybody attacks me. They're coming at me. 
Hajj. They start calling you by your social names. Hajj. Please don't call me Hajj. Just call me Usa. That's all I want. It's good enough for me. Can't we do plan B? Can't we do this? Can't we do this? I said, I'm sorry. I don't feel what you feel. Your emotional code is different than mine. I said, there is no plan B, and we're staying the course, and I don't care what happens. I swear to you, I walk out of the office. I make one more phone call. One more phone call. And four hours later, I had Hassan Abdullah, who was from the Kansas City Chiefs. He set up a meeting with me. And one week later, we were in Florida filming. Imagine I would have stopped at that moment. That's what fear does to us. It cripples us. Where you don't feel like you want to move. But all the power is with Allah. That's how you need to do it. So I hope that answers your question. She's talking about the fear aspect and how you drop the outcome. So when you're dropping the outcome, how does that work? Any other questions? Go ahead. That's a great question. Okay, I've been, so you guys know, I've been the VP of business development for multi-million dollar companies. So I've, I've held positions um, in terms of being the head of direction in terms of development for those kinds of companies as well. So it's not even, but I left the corporate field because there's certain things I just didn't want to do. And for me, everybody who I dealt with was non-Muslim, like literally 99%. So, subhanAllah, you develop a reputation. And there was a chair in my office, and it was called the crying chair. That's what they labeled it. You sit in front of me, you're going to cry. Because I will dig out your pain, and I will show it to you. And I'll say, here you go. Then I start poking at it, and you're like, oh my God. I'm like... So every human being, <laughs> every human being has a frequency. It doesn't matter who they are. They have a frequency. You know where you're dialing the AM channel, the AM channels, and you can't get it right? Then you just like, you lock in on one, just you hear it clearly. I'm, I'm, that's for me, I've developed those kind of tools. So it doesn't matter who you are. I don't care if you can't even speak. I'm, I'm literally like tuned in as a machine on stuff like that. So 7% of communication is, is verbal. 55% is behavioral and dress. And 38% is emotional. I've tuned in on all four languages. I can literally give you mixed messages at one point. Literally in one statement, I can give you mixed messages. I've trained myself at that level. That's very important for you to understand communication is power. Because some of you will be able to influence. Some of you won't. You know why? Because every day you have 27 conversations. The average person has 27 conversations per day. 27 conversations. If you multiply that, that's 9,072 conversations per year. You know what the average influence of original ideas is? 2%. Imagine you can only influence at 2%. then imagine you meet someone and they can influence at 98%. Ladies, trust me. Those guys are out there. Trust me. Trust me. If your walls are guarded, guard them even further. Don't give them a chance. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Trust me. Some of them are artists. They know and they're looking for the smallest little crack. And when they find it, I guarantee you, they will enter. And they will be behind the wall and you won't even know it. That's scary. But 
the reason why I tell you that is because there's being able to persuade, then there's manipulation to get what you want. It's a completely different world. If you meet a monster like that, that's manipulation. That's strength, but in a negative way. And I've met and swam through a lot of people's minds. And I'm telling you, some of them are literally the walking devil. I'm not joking with you. And I will call them out. Literally, I will put it right in their face, and I'm not afraid. Because they know I'm on the inside. I'm the guy, in terms of my profession, you don't want to come across. Why? Because I will enter the wall, and you have no idea. You literally have no idea it's happened. That's how manipulation works. So was it a problem for me? No, not at all. I would actually say to them, and they would get on the call, and imagine there's 150 people to 200 people on a conference call in the company. And the head director will start quoting Imam Ali without knowing him. That's incredible. I've gotten to a place where I was in conferences. Some of you know Les Brown. Who knows Les Brown? Okay. Les Brown is one of my mentors. Literally. I've been on stage with him. I have his number in my phone book. Jarek Robbins, the son of Tony Robbins, texts me today. Literally. If you want to see the text, I'll show it to you. It's not a big deal. It really isn't. I got nominated to speak at the corporate headquarters of Amazon. My nomination got accepted. It's not a big deal. It's Amazon. It's the biggest company in the world. I can sit here and tell you, whoa, yeah, so look at me. No, I represent, I represent here. I'm from Dearborn and Dearborn Heights. This is who I am. Why? Because I represent also my religion. This is why I have to raise the flag. And this is what I have to say in terms of that. We have to be able to do that. So was it a problem? No, it wasn't. That's where I needed to be. That's where my talent actually excelled. And I got a great company that allowed me to do that and share the stage with those kinds of people. Very impactful for my life and where it took me. I got on TED Talk. I have a TEDx talk. You guys should do that as well. Try to get on these stages. There's nothing wrong with it. Represent at the highest level. You know what the end of my talk was? What do you think I finished with? I mentioned his name and I said he was my boy. I literally finished the whole talk with one of his things and I also put his name up there and I don't care. That's my boy. I hope I'm his boy. I don't know. But that's what I'm saying to you. That's how we have to be. So was it a problem? No. I don't care. Represent. Don't be afraid. Wear the scarf proudly. And if you don't, and you're moving towards it, hold on to that. That chastity is the biggest flag that you can own. My God. When you can cross over like that, and I know you look in the mirror, and you're like, I don't know, it doesn't look good. I'm not confident. Or your brother, and you're like, your abs are starting to show through your shirt. It's cool. I, I, I know it's cool. It's okay. But what? It's okay. Cover up a little bit. Just a little bit. Your arms, mashallah, they're like huge. It's okay. Yeah, just cover them a little bit. Cover the guns. Okay? But just, that's chastity. The Prophet says, and I'll finish with this. He says, al haya wa hayain. He says, al haya to have haya is of two types. The first type, al haya ul aqli al haya of the intellect, meaning when you cover your chest, you turn off your Facebook, you turn off, you didn't say that, you turn off your Facebook, you turn off your, because you're getting the wrong attention, it's negative attention. You turn those things off, and it doesn't matter anymore to you. Your heart is not attached. That's what the right kind of haya, meaning shamefulness, 
okay, to feel ashamed to do something. That doesn't belong in the heart anymore. We're being desensitized day by day by day. Then he says the second type is this. al You know what that means? Stupidness. To have shamefulness in stupidity. You never think that haya can be stupid. Why? Let's say you're about to ask a question to a teacher and you never ask the question. You need to go to a job interview and you never go. That's not what you need. You need to have what? Strength there. Because he next says in the next line, in Nahjal Balagha, he says that leads to failure. Fear that leads to failure. Drop the outcome on that level. Have tawakkul. That gives you satisfaction in the heart. That's how it goes. Was it a problem for me? No. It propelled me. It took me to another level. And I'm proud to say what I'm doing right now. I'm proud of it. But it gave me more. Les Brown, at one point, said, he was there and I was there. And we were speaking. We both spoke. Most of my presentations, underlined, underlining that, it's mostly what? A hadith by Imam Ali alayhi salam. One of the directors walks up to stage and he was getting a reward. And he's like, he's just thanking Les Brown. He can't believe Les Brown is there. He's thanking him. And he says, please, somebody go to the back and read off the first two things I have on my paper. The CFO was also what? Muslim. And he's standing right next to me. We're both standing on stage. And the guy goes, he says, an opportunity passes by like a cloud. The CFO goes to me, he goes, that's not Les Brown, that's Imam Ali alayhi salam. This is what you got to understand. Wherever you are at, leave your signature. It doesn't matter where. I taught at Maya at one point. For one year, I was just teaching Arabic. Just wanted to do it, just wanted to experience it. I had the kids get a smart board for that room. They raised it. They raised $4,000. Always leave your signature. Wherever you go, leave your signature as a Muslim and hopefully as a mu'min. Sign time by doing the right things. It doesn't matter where. So did it propel me? 100%. Did it hurt me in certain ways? Some things I would rather not do in a corporate world. Not because of me. Not because of me. It's what you teach. When you teach someone, you empower them. And what they have to do with that information. If they don't have the right ethical code or moral code, you've empowered the wrong person. Do you see what I'm saying? You have to be very careful there. Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy in terms of who I am. I'm not happy in terms of any shape hali. No, that's not what I'm saying. I need to be a lot more. But all all I'm saying to you, I represent and I represent properly. Proudly, not properly. I'm not saying I'm perfect. Be proud of who you are. Don't be afraid. Drop the outcome. Watch what happens. When Allah comes to your aid, my God, He will raise you to a whole other level. I hope that answers your question. That was like a mini like lecture, but I'm sorry. It just gets into it sometimes. Any other questions real quick? Go ahead. Wow. Hold on, I have to take a knee on that one. How do you deal with temptation if you're drawn away from Allah? Okay. <clears throat> All right, really quick. Temptation, you have five different relationships. Really quick. First relationship is with yourself. Okay? Second relationship is with Allah. Third relationship is with others. Fourth relationship is with nature. And fifth relationship nowadays, which represents temptation, is your phone. Okay? I'm sorry. Some of us, between our phone 
And this, no other person can exist. People are bothersome to my relationship with my phone now. I'd rather talk to this thing than what? How many times do you guys get that picture where every single person inside the, the room is what? On their cell phone. Even the baby now is like, wah, 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 and what? It's got a cell phone. They're being called digital natives now as well. So on that level, those five relationships, okay? So I want you to put your relationship with Allah at the top. And I want you to put your relationship with temptation at the bottom. Your relationship with temptation works this way. The second you go towards desire and any sort of anger, you're going towards regressive desires. Anytime your mind dominates over those two desires, which is anger and the aspect of desire, which is emotion on a general level, desire and what? Anger. The mind has to dominate those two. What that means is the second you feel that temptation, it creates an urge. Let's go to a little bit of psychology. What they've studied now is the, when it's, the second it triggers in terms of that temptation, it creates an urge. That urge, if it's not satisfied, becomes an, like an irritation to the person. I have to satisfy it. Now, the further you go into that and you satisfy the urge, the more it becomes you. We talked about the sweetness of sugar, to sugar. Can you remove that? No, it's its essence. You don't want that habit to become your essence. You don't want that. If that becomes you, it's very difficult to remove. It becomes difficult. It becomes entrenched in you. I'm not telling you it's impossible. But that's the problem. And that's how, what? Neurons that fire together, wire together. You're literally wiring your brain into existence. You cannot remove that for the rest of your life or eternity. That becomes you. That's the way it works. Now, how do you do that? This is where willpower has to come in in discipline. Discipline is the key. Discipline is that self-fight. How? The Prophet, when a group came from actual what? Doing jihad, which is the smaller jihad, which is that struggle, which is the one, they went to war. He welcomes them and he says what? He says, welcome to the people who have done the lesser jihad. And they said, what's worse than this? He says, the fight against the self. It's the fight against the desire. So now, how do you remove that? First thing, number one thing, when you feel the urge, number one, that's your strongest point. Imagine you have a lot of muscle, mashallah. Which one of you guys right now is just stacked? <laughs> watch. Okay, so watch this. That's your strongest point. You also have mental muscle, and that actually fatigues throughout the day actually becomes weaker. If you will see a lot of people commit more sins when at the end of the day because they're mentally tired. Once you become tired, you're bored. These are major signs of you what? Not being able to have discipline. Be very careful when you're like that. Put yourself in situations where you're not alone. That's number two. You're, you're strongest when you first feel the urge to tell yourself what? No. Pull back at that moment. Why? Because the second, imagine this, you're walking up a stairway. Walking up a stairway. You go another stairway. You go another stairway. You're going closer to what? To that temptation. You get to the roof. You walk to the edge. You start, you, you're literally on the edge. And you start leaning forward. This is what happens. You go from a point of control and you can still turn back to what? No control. That's how it works. The strongest point you have is right when you feel the urge. Step away. And if you fail, it's okay. It's a slip. Keep going back. Never give up. Never give up. 
that strength at that moment. Now, there's another thing you can do. When, you, when you're in like private, put yourself in public. Another thing, go to sleep. Try to go to sleep. Anything you, you can do to actually remove yourself from thinking about what? Whatever you're about to do. It's about shifting focus. It's, it's situational and attentional focus. The more you can remove that focus on that sin, here's what happens. Now let's go to, again, psychology and actually physiology of the brain. Whenever you have two thoughts and they're challenging each other, here's what happens. Please pay attention to this. If you really haven't paid attention to me, no problem. I'm cool with that. It's okay. But pay attention to this one. When two thoughts are actually against each other, I'm telling myself, no, I shouldn't do this. But the temptation is calling me. Whatever it is. Understand you're in a mental battle. Those two thoughts are in the ring. And they're about to go at it. Whichever one you let win, here's what happens. At that moment, when you make that decision, and you're like, I'm going to do this, and I'm going towards my temptation, that thought gets a dopamine kick. You know what that means? It actually becomes stronger. It's taking more hold of you. When the shaitan starts speaking through your own tongue, understand there's people like that. He creeps into their lap. These are just ways of control. Now your desire is on you, and your intellect is subservient to your desires. That's how you get to the lower levels. And that's the way it works. That habit will literally become you more and more and more. The minute you can stop it, what happens is you start laying down a new neural branch. And that has to grow. You have to water it with your emotions. You have to give it strength with your emotions. And that's the way it works. That neural pathway that you laid down as a temptation is never going to leave you. You can kill it with some weed killer, which is your thought process. Or you can give it strength and empower it even further by just letting it go. And I'm sure the weeds are going to take over your whole grass, which is literally your whole brain. And that's what happens. And when people get to such a point where the heart dies, there's no going back. Allah then seals the heart. That's it. There's no going back. That's when a person literally becomes devilish. You're a walking devil. You're a walking demon. And if you come across people like that, I'm telling you, and I promise you, I've looked into people's eyes, and I swear you, there's nothing on the inside. There's no emotion. This person will literally end your life, and they don't care. It's scary when you sit in front of a person like that. There's no remorse, no holding back. They don't care. That's a walking dead person. You don't want to get there. Those are some mechanisms that you can do. But what I would really recommend is working with someone. Please, guys. We don't believe in coaching. We don't. This community, I'm sorry. We don't. We don't. But look at the Prophet and Imam Ali. Who's the coach of Imam Ali, my boy? Who? Who? The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Look at Salman. Salman was who? Ajami. He was, wasn't even Arab. Not that there's, there's anything that's better or worse. It doesn't matter. That's not the comparison. One of his names was Salsal. Salsal. You know what that means? The one who asks a lot of questions. But the Prophet said, Salman minna ahl al-bayt. How do you get to that level? Mentorship. Get a mentor. Trust me. 
It saves you money when you spend money. It saves you heartache when you're about to get in a relationship. It saves you the spiritual agony of having to what? I can't feel. Trust me. Please do yourself a favor. Find mentorship. Find good people who will show you the way. Because what a mentor does is they lay out their information and it's a light that is casted on who? Your path. That's the way it works. And when they do that, you can see when it's dark why others have to do trial and error and they fall in the ditch. Trust me. Get good mentorship. That's the best thing I can have. And have an accountability partner, a person you can call. One call can save your life sometimes. And that's the way it works. That person that can hold you accountable and tell you no, because you can't tell yourself no. Those are very important things. So find the right friends, but mentors. Mentors are everything. Go ahead. I, I swear to you, I, that means a lot to me. Thank you. But I literally can't even take on any more people. I can't. There's just too much going on. And and I'm sorry, just give me one second. I have to speak to this because this is, this is very important to me. There, there's such a problem in our community. And trust me when I say problem, there's problems. And if you think that's the worst of it, no. It's going to get worse. When the prophet has said that holding on to your faith is like holding on to a hot coal, there's going to come a time when that's going to happen. Guess what? We're in that time. It's happening. Here's what I would tell you. Grab that coal and squeeze it as hard as you can and let it burn into your soul. That's your only form of protection. That's the only way you can protect your soul. Trust me. Hold on to it. Let it burn through your skin. Let it burn the flesh. Let it get to the bone. Because when it touches the right things, there's no pain that's greater than that pain. Trust me. But I'm telling you, you're going to feel pain to do that. Because the temptations, as my sister stated, are everywhere. Click of one button. Instant gratification. The dopamine explosion that happens in your, in your brain when you hit that what? It's like hitting a shot of cocaine. You want to talk about addiction? It's right here. We're programmed. Talk to me after. There's people that I know. There's, but the problem is so vast. I can't do things alone. What I'm starting to do, so you know, is I'm going to start doing um, modules. So I have a website. Okay, You can follow me online. There's a whole bunch of stuff. There's a whole bunch of videos that I have. And I've done them on purpose just for these kinds of things. And alhamdulillah, my daughter is in the back. But someone came up to her the other day. And she, they, they thanked her. To me, you can't give any better thanks than to thank my daughter. And she told, she told her that your dad got me off depression through his videos. And I've never met this person. I'm honored. I'm grateful. But which one of you is going to do that? It's not just me. I'm trying to do everything that I can. Trust me. But we need to step up. All of us need to step up. What are you going to do to solve the problem? Is it about just taking own care of your own? No. You have a social obligation. And that's very important. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, he says, your social obligation 
take all the good deeds, jihad, everything you've ever done, that's like a spit in the ocean compared to enjoining good and forbidding evil. Think about that. That's a social obligation. Some of us, we do it with our heart. Some of us, we do it with our heart, our hand. Some of us, we do it with our heart, our hand, our a tongue, and our hand. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, that's the person who's grabbed on to all traits of goodness. You see a person that's in need, help them. Feel for them. Say something. But we're all scared, right? The CEO is doing something wrong. We're afraid I'm going to lose my job. Imam Ali answers. You know what he says? He says, enjoining the good and forbidding evil doesn't decrease your sustenance or shorten your life. Don't be afraid. Drop the outcome. But be wise in your situations when you're applying. I'm going to be putting modules together on the website. What I'm going to do, those modules are going to have worksheets, and worksheets are going to have exams. I'm going for like 13 and up. That's what I'm going after now because that's where everything really starts. And from there, I'm going to be talking about discipline, like understanding discipline, the science of self-confidence. These are the things I'm tackling that are at the core of the identity and how to build it. So those are the things that I'm going to start doing where I can kind of give myself at a completely different level. And then it's not just me being in one place. It can be what? Expanded. And that's the best I can do right now in terms of that. But that's what I'm doing. Okay, so forgive me. Go ahead. I just took off my shoes for this one, man. I'm getting ready. With you and your son, or your father to you? Okay. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, you don't look like you. But excellent, good for you, man. Okay, so the question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, so I'm going to reiterate what you said, and correct me if I'm wrong if that's, that's the case. So the question is, is how do I hack build the right communication between me and anybody who I have authority over, let's just say? Okay, how do I improve my communication skills? <clears throat> in parenting, and thank you for the question, by the way. In parenting, there's something that's very important. Okay, and it's called emotional honesty. What is emotional honesty? Emotional honesty is when the tongue can say one thing, but the emotions are saying what? Something what? Different. So, I said there's four levels of communication, right? There's four languages of communication. Number one is verbal. Number two is behavioral. Number three is dress. And number four, I'm sorry, is emotional. Okay? So verbal, behavioral, emotional, and dress. Those are the four languages. Now, when I speak to my son, sometimes I have to do what? They do things I don't like. So what do I have to do? I have to come in and do what? Discipline them. Correct? That's what I have to do. So when I do that, it's very important how you set that mechanism up. This is why. 
And this is what you need to use. I'm going to give you the equation of what you need to use. And this is the way it works. And I've used that on my daughter a lot. But she, <laughs> she's falling asleep because she's heard all this before. Trust me. Me and her go at her all the time. She's like, just like coming at me and I'm coming at her. But this is the way it works. So I'll give you an example. And I'm not going to use her. But because she always gets mad at me. <laughs> so here's what happens. Number one thing. Tell your child... Okay, tell him or her, tell him, Baba, do you want control over your own life? What do you think most children are going to say? 100%. Ask anybody. They want control, correct? If they want control, here's what you need to give them that understanding. When someone hands you control and freedom to choose, here's what happens. They hand you responsibility. Okay? Agreed so far? Okay. Now, responsibility requires what? Discipline. Discipline is doing the boring stuff before what? The fun stuff. So when I tell them that, when I'm speaking in like high schools and stuff like that, or universities, I say when somebody hands you control to choose, run. Because now you're going to have to do the boring stuff before what? The fun stuff. When you have to do the boring stuff before the fun stuff, what are you doing? You're prioritizing. Teach them prioritization. That's the key. Regardless of how they feel. So when that person has to do something, if they do the boring stuff before the fun stuff, they have control. And they're disciplining themselves. That's self-discipline. This is where you come in now. If they can't do the self-discipline, what do you do? You have to discipline them. And you have to lay on them what? Rules. Most kids don't like what? Rules. The second they can't do the self-discipline, you have to come in and discipline them. That means you take over the responsibility. That means what? They lose their freedom to choose. Set that process. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, that person will understand. From there, then they have to prioritize their responsibilities. Teach them time management and prioritization. That's discipline. From there, if they can do that, what that creates is higher levels of self-esteem. They actually like themselves more because they get stuff accomplished. Self-esteem is a result. It's not a state. It's a result of getting and getting things right and gaining success, winning the small steps all the time. <laughs> ah, there you go. It's coming out. Okay? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Excellent. So use, use something called the one degree rule. The one degree rule is just stepping back. When the anger hits, step back. Put your tongue in between your teeth and bite down so you don't speak. Literally. And just step back. Once you step back, hold yourself. The prophet says, he says, don't discipline while you are angry. Why? You lose 90% of your cognitive power when you're angry. You become black and white. The frontal cortex literally shuts down, which is the decision-making power. It's incredible. The prophet knew this. So on that level, when you hit that state, back off. Leave the situation and say this. If they triggered you, which you have a right, if they triggered you, and now you're telling the person, I don't like what you just said. Literally say it. I don't like what you just said. I don't respect it and I don't agree with it. When you're in a better state and more calm, come back, talk to me. Otherwise, we're not having this conversation. Walk away. You draw the line in the sand. You let them know how you're thinking, what you're feeling, and what. You don't accept their actions 
and the way they're treating you. Once you do that, what happens? I guarantee you, 99% of the time, they're going to come back to you and they're going to tell you, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Because they have to think now. Why? Because Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, Al-Ihtimal Qabr al My God. If we just, just look at this stuff, it's incredible. He says, to be forbearing, meaning to hold back when you are angry, is the grave of sins for others. They will come back and apologize. Give them the chance to see their mistake. And once you do that, it takes a lot of power and will to be able to draw back. But sometimes you have to be assertive. But don't do it too much. Hold your line. Let them know you don't accept what they're doing. But what? When you do that five or six times, here's what happens. When you are assertive, this is what you say. I didn't disrespect you. I didn't raise my voice at you. You did A, B, C, and D. Which is completely opposite of my behavior. Don't treat me like that. I don't accept it. Who is the victim now? You are. But all you did was hold this thing back. You see how that works? That's a lot of strength. That's mental muscle. You need to pull on that before the action, not after. Because when you pull on that after, you feel regret. I shouldn't have done that. I don't feel right. Does that make sense? So take that in that way. For them to have freedom, they have to have what? They have to own the responsibility. They can't own the responsibility. They have to have, to own the responsibility, you have to have discipline. And explain to them what happens when they put someone in jail. What do they take away? Their freedom. Why? Because they couldn't handle what? The responsibility. Therefore, they didn't have the discipline and they did the fun stuff before what? The boring stuff. It's very simple as a what? Layout. But you've got to be able to do it. But these are the courses, by the way, I'm going to be setting up. Literally, what I just gave you is a source I just gave for, for the high school, uh, high school, which is for Star International. I contracted with them. So if your kids are going there, good for you. But literally, I'm, I'm running 18 sessions for them in terms of these kinds of things. And how do you discipline yourself at those levels? So, inshallah, I hope that helped in terms of what's going on. But I think for now, that's, that's enough. And inshallah, thank you so much. And I just want to say this before you guys leave. Okay. If you haven't went on the retreat, and I wish I would have said this earlier, the retreat for me was the thing that changed my whole life. I literally went as a person who was wearing the tight shirt. Okay? I came back and I wanted to go to Hajj. It was crazy. Like literally. My friends didn't know what happened to me. One of them said, are you going to Bin Laden school? Like literally. Why? But I felt a sense of belonging. If you can go, please go. It will change your life. It will. I guarantee it. If your intention is right, go. Put yourself in these situations. Once I went, I made a promise to myself that I was going to go to Hajj. When I went to Hajj, what happened? It changed my life as well. Then I went to Ziyara. I said, you just continue. The retreat is like a mini Hajj. It is. Great people, great friends, and you'll be able to say what's in your heart. There will, people, will be people there that will listen to you. They, they run them. Ask for the upfront. And I don't know anybody that's part of it. So, guys, I was like you. I was literally following Hassanan and other speakers everywhere they went. Okay? Now, every Thursday night, I mean Hassanan speak at Wise. Like, I'm next. That's my boy, too. Okay? But everyone, everyone here from Sayyid Qazwini, okay? Sayyid Qazwini was the first person I met, literally, at that level. He was, that was the first retreat. So, God bless him, Samahat Sayyid. People like him who take these routes. And they pull people out of the river of society. That's literally what happens. So become also that person. Go on these retreats. And trust me, trust me, 
Trust me. I promise you, you won't regret it. You won't. That was my starting point. Now I sp I've spoken all over, not just national, international. I've been on some of the highest stages. Alhamdulillah. That's by the grace of Allah. But I carry the flag with me wherever I go. And be like that. So that's what you need to do, inshallah. Go on the retreat. My daughter has been on like, I think, what, four or five? At least. Okay, why? These things are what? They're very important for your identity and to know who you are. And to be around people who truly believe in the essence of the religion. Be around people like that. And it's amazing what happens to you. Salah ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I don't know if that's age. <laughs>